from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Marty Bruce, Johnny, at Worldwide Mutual. Oh, hi, Marty. How are you? Did you ever hear of the Mei-Ling Buddha? Mm, nope, I'm afraid I never. It's probably the most valuable piece of jade there is. A little statue not more than three, three and a half inches high. Made during the Mei-Ling Dynasty. And you've insured it? Yes. For how much? 40000 So what's happened to it? I don't know. I don't know if anything's happened to it. Well, if nothing's happened to it... I'm not even sure of that. Huh? That nothing's happened to it. Come on over here and let's talk about it, huh? Yeah. I think I'd better. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Mei Ling Buddha matter. Expense account item one, $1.10 for a taxi from my little apartment to the office of Worldwide Mutual, where Marty wasted no time in getting to the point. I'd know for sure if it weren't for that knuckle-headed Ray Kerner. Who's he? One of our account men. Got back from a European vacation just this morning. For being so stupid, I, I ought to fire him. He knew we'd insured that jade Buddha. And when he saw it over there in Paris a couple of weeks ago, he should have looked into it. Found out what it was doing there. Doing just exactly where, Marty? In a dingy little antique shop somewhere on the Rue de la something or other. He didn't even have sense enough to get the address or the name of the place. Oh, where was it supposed to be? Locked up in the home of the late Daryl Harcourt up in Boston. And of course it isn't. Well, that's the point. I don't know. There's been no report of a theft. Well, if somebody's seen it in Paris, is that Buddha pretty well known among collectors and so on? I told you, it's probably the most valuable piece of jade in the whole world. Then let me use your phone. Sure, here. But if we don't even know what shop or where it is in all of Paris... Just I... leave it to me. My phone call was to a slimy little character whose name is Dumasac, but who calls himself the Chagri, the gray cat, who knows the Paris underwear like the back of his hand. He'd been a lot of help to me some months before in locating a painting that was stolen from my good friend and the actor and art collector Vincent Price. I certainly won't miss you, darling. If you are willing to pay me well. If you can dig up the information I want, I'll mail you a check for a hundred bucks American immediately. Oh, no, Johnny. Oh, only two hundred? What you call bucks for my inestimable services? Oh, monsieur. Okay, two hundred. Now listen. There's a little idol, the mailing Buddha. Yes, I know it well. Oh? I saw it only this morning, here in Paris. Where? At the shop of Monsieur Dubesson on the Rue du Pas de l'Amour. Yes, he was smuggled in only a few weeks ago. And the price on it? Well, for such a rare and exquisite piece, most reasonable. How much? Oh, trente du, uh, oh, 32 million francs. Third, that's around $80,000, so it must be the McCoy. You uh, wish me to, shall we say, obtain it for you? You mean steal it? But of course, monsieur. But for a price. No, no thanks. I'll send you a check. You're giving him 200 bucks just for that. A lot cheaper than my flying over there. Well, yes. So now I'd better check at the home of this, uh, what'd you say the name is? Daryl Harcourt in Boston. I'll put down the address for you. Died about uh, two years ago. Home's in charge of his old housekeeper, a Mrs. Mary Pasco. And I take it his property hasn't been destroyed. Uh, his fine old tapestries and furniture, yes, will to various museums here. Thanks. Everything but the contents of Mrs. Haskell's room and the study. The latter he willed to a nephew, Charles Curtis, to be given to him the day he finishes at Harvard. Well, that's a funny sort of arrangement. Harcourt was a funny man. The Buddha was the only thing of real value in that room. And he figured it was enough uh, to get his nephew started in a business of some kind. I see. 
this Curtis boy get the house, too? No, no. That goes to Mrs. Haskell after Curtis gets the contents of that one room. Well, looks as though I'd better hire myself up to Boston and make sure that Buddha's really gone. Item two, the $200 check to my informant in Paris, who was sure he'd seen the mailing Buddha, was sure it had only arrived there recently. But if so, why hadn't it been reported missing from the home of the late Daryl Harcourt up in Boston? Item three, 50 bucks deposited on a rental car. When I reached Boston, I headed west on Beacon Street, a couple of miles beyond Kenmore Square, and there on a little side street found the Harcourt home. It wasn't much of a place anymore. The lawn and garden had been neglected, and the building itself was in need of repair. The doorbell was the old-fashioned kind. Yes? Mrs. Haskell, I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Oh, of course. Do come in, Mr. Dollar. Rather dismal. Mm. Desolate, isn't it? Ah. You live here all the time? I am responsible for this house until the terms of the will are fully met. That's when Charles Curtis finishes school. Yes. Of course, my own quarters at the back are as tidy as they've always been, and Mr. Harcourt's study is exactly as it was when he passed away. I want to see that study, Mrs. Haskell. Oh, no, Mr. Dollar. It's to be left as it is until Master Charles opens it to claim his inheritance. You're talking about the mainling Buddha. And the furniture and books and things. How long since you've seen that little jade idol? Why, not since Mr. Harcourt died. I locked the door and it hasn't been opened since, except that it's Well, I'm sorry, but I have to look around in there. But, Mr. Dollar... You have the key? Of course. I keep it on this chain about my neck at all times. Let me have it, please. But, Mr. Dollar, I... Listen... I can get a court order if necessary, but it would only waste time. But how am I to know if you're even... Well, that is... Here. Here are my credentials. I'm a fully authorized agent of the company that insured that Buddha. But I, I'm responsible... Has it occurred to you, Mrs. Haskell, that the mailing Buddha might possibly have been stolen? That's impossible. Is it? Okay, where's the study? I... I'll go with you. By all means. And I'll open the door. Here, now. Hmm. This door looks a couple of inches thick. Just, just like the one to the library where Mr. Harcourt kept all his lovely tapestries. Oh, dear, look at all that dust. Dust is right. It was on everything. The accumulation of a couple of years... On the desk, the chairs, the oaken floor, bookshelves, and tables. The room was dark and gloomy. Yes. It looks just the same, except for all this horrible dust. But as I told you, Mr. Dollar, this is the first time the door has been opened. Yeah. Now, where is the... Oops. Oh! Oh, I hope you didn't hurt yourself. No, no, I, I just didn't see it. But he always insisted on keeping the electric fan on that little table next to the door. Yeah. Now, where's the Buddha? In the little wooden casket on the desk. Now, let's see. Hmm. Now. Well. I was afraid of this. Afraid of what, Mr... Oh, no. It's gone. The Buddha's gone. Yeah. Oh, no. I searched the room thoroughly and found no trace of the mailing Buddha. Somehow, someone had got in that locked room and stolen it. It must have happened recently. A piece as valuable as that wouldn't be allowed to lie around for long. The Vaisak had told me it arrived in Paris only a few weeks ago, and I had no reason to doubt it. How could anyone possibly have got in there without leaving marks in the dust that swirled about our feet every time we moved, that showed a clear imprint of every step we made, that left a mark on everything I touched? Oh, dear. Oh, dear, Mr. Dollar. This is terrible. You're sure you have the only key to this room, Mrs. Haskell? Yes. It was entrusted to me to prevent this very thing. Oh, dear. What about the nephew, Charles Curtis? No, I'm, I'm sure he's never had one. You think he could have got hold of yours and had a copy made? No, impossible, Mr. Dollar. Oh, dear. Where is he? At school at Harvard. I think I'd better see that boy. Well, certainly you can't think that Master Charles did this. I don't know what to think yet. 
Tell me, you're absolutely sure you've let no one in here since Mr. Harcourt died? You can tell by the dust over everything that no one has been in here. Not for years. You're sure of that? Absolutely. Well, except for the federal tax man, of course, the appraiser for the estate. Oh? When was that? A month or so after Mr. Harcourt passed away. And yet the piece showed up in Paris only a few... I was with him, Mr. Dollar, and so was the attorney. Who was the attorney? Mr. Howard Bancroft in town. Do you have his address? His office is just off Copley Square. Uh Uh-huh. And I've got two people to see. Charles Curtis and Howard Bancroft. Uh, Mr. Dollar. About Master Charles. He's a good boy. Oh, yeah. I'm sure of it. You simply can't think that he... And anyhow, no one could have gotten here without leaving a trail. Mr. Dollar... Now, look. I want you to close up this room again and leave it closed. I'll be back. Please, Mr. Dollar. About Charles, listen to me. Maybe later, Mrs. Haskell. Later? Yeah. After I've talked to him. One thing puzzled me. If young Charles Curtis did steal the Buddha, why did he do it? After a few months more at Harvard, he'd get it anyway. And he'd be able to sell it on the legitimate market for a lot more than it would ever bring on the Paris black market. On the way in to look him up, I stopped at the office of the lawyer, Howard Bancroft. I I can't believe it, Mr. Dollar. Well, the fact remains, Mr. Bancroft, that the Buddha's not only missing from the Harcourt home, but has turned up in Paris. But the only person who had access to that room was Mrs. Haskell, in accordance with Mr. Harcourt's wishes. That room hasn't been entered for years until today. And yet, if the Buddha has shown up only recently... I'm afraid I don't follow you, sir. Mr. Harcourt willed it to his nephew, didn't he? That's right. Charles Curtis, when he finished his school. And he willed the house to Mrs. Haskell, didn't he? Yes. And it will be little enough reward for her years of service to him. How do you mean? Mr. Harcourt paid her very little during all those years. She, and I too, quite frankly, felt she was entitled to a great deal more. You see, his really valuable things, the collection of tapestries, he willed to various museums. So I understood. They were kept in an hermetically sealed room, a library. Hermetically sealed? Practically. Didn't you notice the tremendous doors on the study and library, the sealed windows? Then how could any dust? Hmm... What? Um, about Charles Curtis, Mr. Bancroft. Admirable young man. In addition to the money his uncle always gave him, uh, well, his own family is very wealthy, you know. No, I didn't know. Yes. They've given him everything he wants, and it hasn't spoiled him a bit. Even during college? He's an excellent, hard-working student. He's going to be a lawyer, Mr. Dollar, and he'll be a good one. And maybe my thinking about him has been wrong. Oh, Definitely. Why, Mr. Dollar, he's planned to donate the mailing Buddha to a museum when it comes into his possession. So you see... Ah, uh, it's just that after handling more or less straight insurance cases for so many years, I almost instinctively suspect anyone close to the, well, to the problem at hand. In this case, young Charles Curtis. Even Mrs. Haskell. Maybe even you. I beg your pardon. But I guess I'd better just shake the dust out of my brain and tackle this as a plain, ordinary... Wait a minute. Dust. Eh? It's a little matter of dust that really has me stopped. It makes it impossible for that room to have been edited since... Tapestries, you said. I mentioned them. Of course. How blind can I be? Eh? Look, you better get ready for some legal action on behalf of your client, the late Mr. Daryl Harcourt. What? I'm going to play a hunch, Mr. Bancroft. Maybe it's all wrong. Maybe it's crazy. But I'm going to play it to the hilt. <laughs> You can't do this. You have no right. Now, we'll see about that. These are my own personal things. I don't believe you're an insurance investigator at all. Please, whatever you like. Have you a warrant to search my room this way? No. No, you're just some thief, some... Uh Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. This bank book in your name. No. You give me that. Uh Uh-huh. Some 20 years of a balance that... 
that never got above six or seven hundred dollars. Give me that. Here, here. Two months ago, a single deposit of twenty-one thousand. That was money that I that. That was the money you got from some crook. We let the police run him down. Some crook who smuggled the mailing Buddha over to Paris after you stole it out of the study. That's impossible, and you know it. That study hasn't been open for nearly two years. You saw the layer of dust in there yourself. Oh yes, you pointed it out to me half a dozen times. I should have caught on then. Come on, we're going into that study. Give me the key. No, I won't. Then I'll have to rip it off that chain around your neck. All right. Here. What you saw for yourself? Yes, I saw it all right. And I didn't have sense enough to realize what kind of dust that was. Here now, look at it. Full as earth. What are you talking about? About the old-fashioned method of cleaning fine tapestries with full as earth. That's the way Mr. Harcourt cleaned them, isn't it? What difference does that make? And there's probably a supply of it down in the cellar somewhere that he always kept on hand. What if there is? That doesn't prove anything. Yeah, yeah, I was blind. Blind as a bat when I knocked over this electric fan that didn't have any dust on it. Because it's what you use to spread the dust. The fine particles of Fuller's earth all over this room. A little sackful, maybe, held in front of the fan. Now, listen. And it left proof, apparently, that nobody had been in here for a couple of years. Yeah. It had me fooled, but not anymore. Better get your coat, Mrs. Haskell. No. No. Mr. Dollar, I deserved far more from Mr. Harcourt for my years of service and of watching him squander his money on the idle tapestries and on that nephew who had money of his own. Now, I have money. Plenty. Plenty, Mr. Dollar. More than I need. I'm an old woman. But you, you're young. Perhaps you could use some of it. Perhaps ten or twelve thousand dollars. You'll have to think of a better way out than that, Mrs. Haskell. Please. And you know something... I have a notion you're going to have time to think about a lot of things. Plenty of time. Yeah, I know. The Mailing Buddha still has to be brought back from Paris. Maybe I'll get the assignment. Maybe it'll go to one of our regular foreign investigators. As for Mrs. Haskell, well, I'm sure Mr. Bancroft will lose no time in taking whatever steps are necessary. So... Expense account total, including mileage on my rental car and a few incidentals. Well, call it 300 bucks even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, far be it for me to get up on a soapbox, but... I hope you'll make a point of listening to it. It concerns a lot of money in the wrong hands, in the hands of a bunch of kids too young to meet responsibility, too young to realize that cutting loose from family before they're ready can lead to trouble. In this case, murder. Yeah, I think you'd better hear it. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Paul Duboff, Will Wright, and Boris Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs>